Hello friends. For today's video, I'm going to be going through eight completed adult fantasy series. I'm going to structure this by having the first three series that I talk about be ones that I think are the easiest to get into. And so that way, if you're somebody who has primarily read young adult and you're looking to try adult fantasy, these ones might be good ones to transition into that age range. Or maybe you're somebody who doesn't read a ton of fantasy, or maybe you're somebody who loves fantasy, but as video games or TV shows, and you're looking to try fantasy books, then these ones are the most user-friendly. The two middle series are going to be the ones that, as you would expect, kind of fall right in the middle. They're not too intense, but they are going to have more perspectives or they're going to have more complex storylines or magic systems. And then at the end, the last three will be ones that are a little bit more epic. And some of them have a lot more books within the series or the plots themselves are very bizarre and maybe are not the easiest to get into and they're going to be a little more demanding of your time and attention. You might have to be like, what the heck is going on here? So those will be the ones that I talk about at the end. Jumping into it and starting with the first three that I think are relatively easy to get into. In fact, some of these I even will see considered or shelved as young adult, and that would be Daughter of the Moon Goddess, A Darker Shade of Magic, and Queen of Blood. The series name for this one would be Queens of Renthia. And I'll go ahead and start with that one. You've likely heard me talk about the setting of this one quite a few times, as it does have one of my favorite settings in all of fantasy. The setup is that we follow a young girl who at the very beginning of the story, she sees her village horrifically destroyed. And it is destroyed by these beings known as spirits. They protect the forest and the forest is where human beings live. So you have a lot that's really intricate with the world building when it comes to how people traverse through the forest, how they live within the trees and they live among the tree tops. And then you wanna avoid the bottom because that's where spirits are more likely to be. And these spirits can come in all different forms and it's actually have, it has a little bit of horror leanings to it in some ways. And so we see at the very beginning of the story, we see these spirits that are meant to be held in check by one of the most powerful magic users of their society. However, clearly that person has a very tenuous hold on these spirits as we see with this attack at the beginning. So our main character finds herself wanting to learn more about her own magic so that maybe someday she can become the person that holds the spirits in check. However, as we are following this character throughout the book, we are seeing that she's not really the best. <laughs> and it's very different than what you typically find because a lot of times the trope is you have the chosen one who comes from humble beginnings. And with her, it's like, I came from a horrific beginning and also that didn't make me the best. It was sad and awful, but I'm still not better than anyone else when it comes to the magic. But it definitely seems like there is this threat of these spirits, so what's gonna happen? And the first book, we primarily follow this character in the second and third books. You are going to see the perspectives kind of open up and you are going to get a grander view of this world. I think that some of the mysteries throughout the series are really compelling and interesting. Although I personally think that the first two books are the best in the series. The third one actually is not my favorite. But of course, it's going to be so different from person to person. I've some I've seen some people love the first book and then really not like the second because we do kind of focus on a different character. But it is going to be, I would say, a very different reading experience than likely you're accustomed to. One, because of the subversion of the tropes of the chosen one. And then also just because it plays around with perspectives and it you do start to see the world through these other characters and some things you expect to go a certain way and then they don't at all. So it is one that I would recommend for the setting alone because I think it's told in an interesting way. But I do think that as a series, it doesn't have its strength in the ending. I think it has its strengths in its setting. Next up, we have Daughter of the Moon Goddess. This is the one that, in my opinion, feels the most young adult of all of the ones that we're going to talk about. This is a duology. Queens of Renthia is a trilogy. This one we have two books and then Shades of Magic, which I'll talk about after this one, has three books and it is going to get a continuation series very soon, which is very exciting if you're a fan. So Daughter of the Moon Goddess though, getting back to this one, this is more so fantasy with a very strong romantic subplot. I don't know, you could categorize this as fantasy romance, but it's much more of like a wholesome coming of age romance. So it feels more like it's a part of the character 
growing up, and the story does feel somewhat coming of age, so there being a romantic subplot throughout the duology feels more like it goes hand in hand with that, with that. But you follow this young girl who is the daughter of the moon goddess, as the title implies, and her mother has been secluded to her celestial kingdom, but she doesn't get to live with the other celestials. And you don't quite know everything that happened, but you do know that her daughter, our main character, her existence is a secret, and the mother does not want anybody to find out that she exists, but some there is a point where some people come and our main character has to flee, and she has to leave her mother. And so when she does this, she ends up among the other celestial beings, and she is having to start from a very humble place and sort of work her way up, discover more about why her mother is in seclusion, what she could do to no longer have her mother isolated. And also, she's learning more about herself, her family, her father, because she doesn't know a whole lot about him. And as she's doing all this, she's getting to know other people along the way, some of which become friends, some of which are brothers and sisters in arms, and some of them are romantic interests. And the duology as a whole, I would say it's described, everything is described in such a pretty way. So in, in a sense, how gorgeous this cover is, it's kind of how everything feels. Everything feels just so delicate and beautiful and sparkly. And I would say that the emotions are very heightened. Everything seems a little bit dramatic. It almost feels like you're watching a drama, I think. But it has that fairy tale, a pretty fairy tale feel to it, while having, of course, still some stakes. I think, like I said before, that it is the most young adult feeling, so some of the tropes are going to feel pretty familiar. It's kind of the opposite of Queen of Blood, where some of the tropes are going to feel like things you've probably encountered before, but I do think that that can create a sense of coziness to a story. Like, you can just curl up with a blanket and have a nice drink and just feel like you can get lost in something that isn't going to have too many twists and turns or isn't going to be too bleak or anything like that. So it is a pretty duology. It is a, a lovely duology, and it's a little bit of an angsty one <laughs> as well. After that, with Shades of Magic, the setup for this story is that we follow a young man named Kel who has the ability to travel between parallel Londons. And these parallel Londons, there are several different ones, and each one is thought of as different colors as the worlds themselves. themselves. When he goes between these worlds, they are kind of seen through different colors. And there's a lot of edginess to any of V.E. Schwab's works, really, but especially, I would say, her adult works. That's not true. All of her works are edgy. <laughs> and this one is no exception. So Kel is kind of a moody boy. And the setup in the first one is that between these parallel Londons, he is not meant to bring something from one into the next. It can kind of destroy the order of things. But he sort of accidentally does. And then all of a sudden, he is kind of on the run, we'll say, and he ends up allying himself with another individual. And the first book starts quite slow, and then once the plot line picks up, it's race to the finish line. It's very quick. The second one, we a little bit shift to one of his allies from the first book. They get a little bit more time in the second one. And then the third book, everything becomes so much bigger, the stakes get really enormous, and you start to see another character who has been there the whole time. You're starting to see them a little bit more, as well as zeroing in a little bit on the villain. And it's actually one of my favorite villains in a lot of the fantasy that I've read. It's a very complex villain that once you see, you're kind of pulling the curtain back and seeing what they've been through, then you kind of ask yourself, like, are they a villain? <laughs> Which I always really like in, uh, in fantasy stories in general. So those are the first three that I said are the most accessible. I think the ones that are a little bit closer to young adult. The next two are ones that I just think these are, they're not extremely difficult to get into, but they, they still have things about them that make them a little more complex. So the two are going to be the Drowning Empire trilogy. So there's three books there. And then the Mistborn trilogy. So there's three books in the original trilogy. And then there are four books. So there's a quartet that comes after. And there's also a novella that you can read. So if you like the Mistborn trilogy, you have a whole lot more <laughs> that you can consume. And all of it's done. So that's nice. I'll go ahead and start with Mistborn. You've likely seen me talk about this a lot. Everybody else talk about this a lot. You've seen it probably on lists of great <laughs> entry points to adult fantasy. 
I don't know how much I really need to say about it, but if you don't know anything about Mistborn, the setup is that we follow this young street urchin named Vin. She is part of the lower class in society known as the Ska, and society is primarily broken up between Ska and nobles. There's a huge discrepancy between wealth and privilege and all of those things. So the Ska are really at the very bottom and the nobles are at the very top. And then the person who rules over all of them is known as the Lord Ruler. The tagline for the story, and I think you'll even see it printed on the UK covers, is what if the Dark Lord won? So the idea is what if back in the day there was a chosen one and they failed and what would that world look like? And so we're looking at a thousand years into that idea and that is what you start out with at the beginning of Mistborn. So Vin is somebody who is a part of this society and is a part of this ska population. And somebody named Kelsier sees some things in Vin that they think indicates that she might have more power than she realizes. The magic system is a thing that, of course, everybody notes when they talk about Mistborn as it is a really cool, complex magic system. But also, once the rules and limitations are established, it's actually very easy to understand and grasp because Sanderson is known for approaching his magic systems in a almost scientific way. And so the idea is that people can ingest metals and certain individuals have a power derived from specific metals and those individuals are called mistings. Then you have mistborn who are people that have access to all the powers that can be derived from any of the metals. And those are some of the most powerful beings in society. And Kelsier and Vin and a ragtag group of other characters come together because they think, you know what? We're tired of the oppression. We want to see if we can take the Lord Ruler down. So that's Mistborn. The series is interesting in that the first book is a high story, but the second one is going to be much more political. So if you like political, fantasy, the second book is probably going to be your favorite. And then the third trilogy, trilo the third trilogy, the third book, excuse me, in the trilogy becomes almost apocalyptic in how intense the stakes get and the characters are just edge of their seat or you're on the edge of your seat watching the characters not know what the heck to do or what's going on or how to face what they have to face. We'll just say that. So it's a fantastic trilogy. I think as a whole, each book adds something to the story as a whole. Each book has its own sort of almost subgenre of fantasy that it is really dwelling in, which I think is fantastic. Mistborn's like one of my favorites. So you can tell I like it a lot. Moving on, we have the Drowning Empire trilogy. This is one where the reason I'm placing this a little bit higher, even though the writing style itself is really easy to get into, is how interesting the first book is, how much of a genre bender the first book is, and because of the different perspectives that the author uses throughout this first book, and also the rest of the trilogy, I think make it so that it can be a little disorienting. The setup for the story is we follow the society where there is something called bone shard magic, and a lot of people are forced to give pieces of their bones to their emperor. He then uses those bones to create beings known as constructs, who will obey him because he writes commands into these bones. And so then these beings become like his spies, his soldiers, they serve him and they serve him very loyally. But anytime a construct is made, the pieces of the bones, anybody whose bone is used for that construct then becomes sick. So a lot of society doesn't really like this setup. They don't really like this shard sickness that they get. And the emperor has a lot of secrets that the main character, Lin, is trying to uncover as she is his daughter. She is next in line. She's expected to be the one to know how to use bone shard magic when she ascends to the throne. But Lin is missing a lot of her memories. And so there's a lot of a mystery going on with her perspective. You also follow a couple of other perspectives that are involved with society and politics on a smaller level than the emperor. Then you have a character who is traveling around looking for their missing wife and seeing how all these character stories are interwoven throughout the trilogy, I really, really liked. I think that the characters are very easy to immediately feel yourself connected to, which is almost necessary because for quite a while in this book, you will likely be a little bit confused. And I do think that there's also the interesting decision of having some of the characters' perspectives in first person and then some in third person. So there's a lot to it that's interesting with the world, with the magic, with those perspectives. But what I said earlier about the writing style being accessible, 
it doesn't feel like she's trying to keep you in the dark. It just feels like there's so much to this world and it just takes a little bit before you feel like you fully understand and you have your feet firmly planted on the ground. The second book I think definitely is much more fantasy as opposed to being a genre bender. And then the third book, definitely also still more fantasy in my opinion, but the third book is going to, I think it's relatively new, so we'll see, but I have a feeling that a lot of people are gonna be slightly mixed in their feelings for the third book because it does have a time skip between the second and the third one, and that time skip leaves some information for you to try and discover and figure out throughout the third one. And so the second one where it ends, it was a really bold, interesting choice because you expect to pick up right there and then you don't, and you're like, wait, what? And I think that's gonna frustrate some people. I think there's some plot lines that feel like, what are we doing over here? So the third one, while not perfect, I still thought was solid. And I really liked that the series as a whole, it feels like there's stakes. It feels like there's consequences and sacrifices by the end. After that, we have our three that are not the easiest to get into, but that I definitely still think are worth checking out. And that would be The Witcher series by Andrzej Sapkowski, First Law by Abercrombie, and Winnowing Flame by Jen Williams. At the beginning, I think I said something like, well, some of them are kind of bizarre. And I wonder how many of you are like, she's gonna talk about Winnowing Flame. <laughs> of course I am, I love Winnowing Flame. So let's start with that one. Winnowing Flame is a really epic out there trilogy. I won't get too into the synopsis right now because it takes a lot to even a little bit scratch the surface. But very briefly, there is a very old race of beings known as Eborans that are dying out and they are pretty hated by the rest of society as they chose to feed on a lot of other people in order to try and maintain near immortality. But that has worked against them as a lot of them are now dying out from something called the Crimson Flux. That is a direct it's a direct relation to their feeding on humans. So people aren't too choked up about the Aborans dying out, except that the Aborans, being an ancient race of beings, hold the secrets to these antagonists that nobody else really knows anything about. So we don't really know what the heck is going to happen, but you have a feeling there's just this looming dread throughout the trilogy, throughout the first book. You're like, um, something's going to happen and something's going to arrive but what, and also what are we doing in the meantime? <laughs> and so you're just kind of trying to figure out this world and you follow a character who's kind of like an archeologist as she is trying to look at the remains of what has come before to see if she can piece together these threats that nobody seems to know the secrets of anymore. And with her is one of a, the very young Eborans. He's still an adult, but he's young for an Eboran, so he doesn't have the secrets either, but he's tired of watching everybody he knows die slowly and horrifically. And then the third character is a witch. Not a witch like you've seen before, but she does have some very interesting, cool magic. These three characters come together to try and solve the mysteries of their world. This whole trilogy is weird, but the third one is the, it's one of the weirdest books I've ever read. But I love this, I love the series. I love how unique it is. I love how bizarre it is. I love how epic it is. I love that it's kind of sci fantasy. I just love it. I think it's so interesting and unique and weird. And I love the characters. I love the mystery of everything. It's great. After that, First Law by Joe Abercrombie. This is basically everybody's grim dark recommendation because Joe Abercrombie is kind of just known for being great at grim dark because he has a way of capturing the monotony of life, <laughs> the dread of our existence, how meaningless we feel, how much we don't think that we have any say or power to do anything impactful and uh, how nothing matters. He's really good at capturing that. So if you're feeling edgy and moody and depressed about the state of anything and your existence as a whole, then you'll read this and you'll be like, wow, he captures this so well, while also making you laugh and having really morally gray characters that somehow you absolutely love and are some of the most notable characters in any fantasy series. The first book, for the longest time, you're kind of probably gonna be like, what are we doing? What is, the, what's the plot? There really isn't a whole lot of a plot. I think this is one of those series that people told me when I was reading it, that the plot is there in hindsight. And I feel like that's a weird statement, but it's kind of true in that once you get to the end, you're like, I think this was the purpose. I don't know that I agree that there's a plot in hindsight. I think you can say, I knew some of what certain characters were going for, 
But that doesn't, it doesn't really feel like there's ever something driving everybody. There's no antagonist that you're like, we must bring this person down. It's not Mistborn with the Lord Ruler. So the first book, you're just like, all right, I guess I'll just follow these people, I suppose. The second book was my favorite because you actually get some plot lines that are coming together and you're seeing characters interact with each other. And it is very amusing and entertaining. And you start to see characters grow and you're like, oh, look at them. And then, because it's... Because it's Joe Abercrombie, you're like, except for nobody ever changes. And it's also disappointing and aggravating, but funny. And then the third book, you're just like, nothing matters. Gosh darn it. But in kind of the best of ways. It's one of those series endings that I'm like, I just, I don't love the third book. But I respect it. You know? <laughs> and sometimes there's days where I'm like, it's actually brilliant. Because it's true, nothing matters. And then there's other days where I'm like... There should have been something more satisfying. It's just, it's one of those where it definitely brings about, I think, a lot of feelings, <laughs> some frustrations in you, but in a way that it's very self-aware. The last for today, we have the Witcher series. I know because of the Netflix show and the video games, it seems like it would be a great one to have be more accessible because there's other areas where people already are somewhat, somewhat familiar with this series. But I don't know if people realize, one, how weird of a start this series has, and two, just how little you actually get of the main characters in this. So the first two books are actually collections of short stories. And in my opinion, are the best of the series. If you even want to count these as part of the series. Because I think Andrzej Sapkowski is a fantastic short story writer. But this is where you're going to see the beginnings of everything. And then after these two collections of short stories, you have the main series, which is made up of five different books. And then you also have a side cool prequel sort of story that comes after that but the events of that take place sort of between the short stories certain ones and the main series also the first collection of short stories is not told in chronological order so it's a lot to try to get into this and once you get into the main series you will see you really don't see that much of Geralt, Yennefer, and Ciri. You bounce around between so many different nobles, elves, random people, random creatures. You just you go to so many different areas and you stay with them for a super long time. And you're like, when the heck am I going to get back to my main characters that I like? So all that to say, I still really like this series. I think that Sapkowski does a fantastic job of showing what... I mean, you see so many fantasy books that are trying to be medieval Europe and to try to capture somewhat historical fiction, that, that feeling. And I think Andrzej Sapkowski really captures the bleakness and the horrors of people in power, what they're willing to do for their own gain, how many lives they're willing to destroy, and how that trickles down to the very bottom of society and what that looks like. And so there are many times throughout the series that you're seeing our characters go through a war-torn land and they're seeing what happened in those areas and it's horrible. But you also have characters that are rather witty and interesting and you have fantasy elements tied in and the fantasy elements are very much tied to folklore so you're gonna get grim fairy tale feelings in a lot of these and a lot of it it gets much darker it's not pretty it's not sweet there are the there's the occasional moment of found family and the characters caring for each other but it is not the easiest even just emotionally to read because of seeing everything that that transpires I think he captures the horrors of the world without trying to romanticize them. And I think that uh, I've actually seen him say that he thinks Abercrombie is one of the best modern fantasy writers. And these two, I think, actually do go well together. I've recommended uh, The Blade itself if you like Witcher, and I've recommended Witcher if you like The Blade itself. So I think that these two pair well together. But again, not the easiest to get into, but I think if you like the show, if you, well, if you like the show, I'm happy for you. I don't like the show. But if you like the show or you like the video game, I definitely think the books are worth giving a try. They are a translated, uh, it's a translated story. So there's going to be some things that maybe are a little lost in translation and are going to be different than what you're used to. His writing style is not necessarily the norm when it comes to Western writing style. So his humor is very dry and sometimes barely there. And sometimes uh, the sentences will feel as though they're going on and on and on and on. So there's going to be some things to get used to. That's another reason it's not as accessible. But I do still think that the Witcher series is 
worth reading. <laughs> anyway, that is it for some completed adult fantasy series. Let me know of some that you really, really love. I know there's so many more than just these eight. Uh, I know that there's also plenty of series that we'll be getting conclusions to here in the next year or two, you know, like Stormlight Archive. And so I can't wait for that. But anyway, thanks so much for watching. I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day and I'll see you later. Bye.